that's um, and Paul, that's every time I hear more about your program, and, and I I just admire it so much more. And and I mean, I had read these slides before today, but when I hear your voices describing um, the type of engagement that happens and the way that this program has come together, it's just it's there's so there's so much potential in this program. Um, to, to to be a model for you know public health practitioners to draw on the community to actually inform the work that's being done, and that's you know really what I'm hoping to to get at a little bit in the, in the question. So um, as I as I start talking here for a few seconds, I really want to encourage people to um, drop their questions in the chat box and. Um, we will verbalize them to our speakers here. But before we, we go uh, any further, I do want to welcome a few folks to the conversation. So um, online, we have three people from the PEEP program. We have uh, Sherry and Jenny. Oh, my mouse isn't working here. <laughs> Sherry and Beth and Jenny. And um, ladies, if you can press pound six to unmute your phones. Um, she, Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, who we got there? Oh, sorry, <laughs> that's Jenny. <laughs> hey, Jenny, why don't you say um, a quick word about yourself before I introduce that? Oh, okay. I'm Jenny McDougall. I'm from Cornell. Uh, I live, work, and play on the Lataco Dene Nation, the unceded territory of the Lataco Dene Nation. Um, I am also a member of PEEP, obviously, and um, I do many things in the community, um, mostly Sea Sun stuff and uh, the Clean Team. And uh, um, PEEP has also educated me uh, quite a bit, and I just love this. I love this program um, and the people in it, and I'm honored to be here today. Thank you. I'm so glad that you could join, Jenny. Thank you very much. Um, I will introduce Beth Haywood because I know she's listening, but I, I know that Beth is also at work right now. And so if we need her to help with a question, she'll come on. But she asked me to um, introduce her. And so Beth Haywood vol started volunteering at AIDS Vancouver Island in Victoria in 2018. And she was hired as a staff member soon after that. She is the first point of contact at AIDS Va Vancouver Island in the Victoria office where she distributes harm reduction supplies and she also co-facilitator for the support group for caregivers there who use substances at um, ABI West Shore. And Beth joined the Pete Provincial Advisory Committee in 2019 and represents the Vancouver Island region there. And so um, Beth, we might call on you to help with questions. And Sherry, are you online? If you're there, Sherry, press pound six to unmute. So she might not quite have made it. I will, um, I will say Sherry is a member of the BC uh, Yukon Drug War Survivors. She's employed by Sarah for Women, which is a nonprofit society that provides safe space for women in, in Abbotsford, BC. And she is really, really dedicated to bringing harm reduction to community and um, has been with PEAK since about 2015. So um, she may join us as we go along here, but um, otherwise we have Beth and Jenny to help us here. So. Um, I know that there are a few questions that are coming in. Kristen, are you are you ready with a couple of questions? Uh, yeah, absolutely. I have a, I have a few here that I can share. And thank you, everybody, so much for sending in your, your very thoughtful um, your very thoughtful questions. I also did just want to say uh, thank you to Charlene and Paul. And Charlene, one thing that you did say at the very beginning really resonated with me about stigma and how um, it comes from a very empathetic place and that there are so many things in place that kind of, I think I don't have the right words, but drain one's sense of empathy for others. And that really uh, stuck with me. Thank you for sharing that. That's something I will definitely be taking forward from, from today as well. Um, I think there were a few questions that were answered in the chat. Um, and uh, I have a couple more here. Um, so I think related to uh, what, we, what you were talking about, Charlene, in terms of uh, paying people um, for their time, uh, what would be uh, perhaps considered and in what circumstances would it be considered uh, an appropriate or equitable amount of a stipend for uh, people who are invited to uh, planning and programming meetings? Sorry, could you uh, repeat the initial part of your um, question with how to oh. meaningfully engage people within meetings, the context of meetings and gatherings? Um, yeah. 
Yeah, so I think I think it's uh, a little bit about how how to successfully um, uh, and how, how to successfully engage people and provide an equitable amount of uh, uh, stipend for the people that you are engaging with in the different uh, program and planning aspects. So um, within the peer practice uh, best practice guidelines, it is identified that. Um, uh, uh, $25 per hour is a reasonable rate. We know that sometimes there is um, challenges around certain organizations that don't have large amounts of funding. Uh, uh, funding. And so thinking about it from like uh, uh, agency or organization's positions, it is a recommendation of $25 per hour. But if you think about like equitable ways uh, to bring peers to the table, I, it's really about supporting opportunity to build capacity for people with lived and living experience and really taking into consideration somebody who has some experiential work uh, in the line of uh, being a peer coordinator and having the ability to support peers, uh, whether it's at a meeting or a gathering where they may be leaving their community and coming to another community. Uh, peer coordinators have the ability to think about all of those different pieces and components that might be really important for people with lived and living experience when they're engaged at tables, but also uh, a provincial peer coordinator or peer coordinator should really be thinking about um, connecting with the people that they're working with, get, gathering feedback to what's working well, what's not might not be working, celebrating successes, but also addressing barriers to access. And so I always highly recommend that uh, people reach out and find a peer coordinator to really assist uh, to ensure that the process is equitable and respectful and culturally safe as well. Hmm. Thanks, really Kevin. Point. Yeah, and I and I think that really gets to the point too, as uh, that it, it's it's much more than it's much more than the stipend. I think that um, that that should be considered, right? There's so many different ways you can support uh, support people, and those are those are also really important to consider. And I think Laura too. Thank you for uh, sharing the, the the link to the peer payment guidelines um, that Charlie mentioned. So that link should be posted in the chat box as well. Kristen, it's Diane. Can I just um, can I just add a comment before you go to the next question? Yeah. So, so something um, you know, something that I've been I've been thinking about since um, COVID, <laughs> since COVID hit. Um, you know, uh, we we talked in the before days. We talked a lot about um, you know um, providing you know basic income, for example, or addressing some of the the uh, structural conditions that. Um, uh, make people vulnerable to illness or disease or um, uh, other, you know, other marginalizing circumstances. And um, and COVID hit, and um, you know, there's there's suddenly, um, maybe differently in some areas, been some attention to um, providing some supplementary income and to um, addressing work conditions, and you know, some of those. Uh, you know what we've called social or structural determinants, and you know it's, it's some of the conversations I've been having in in my work and and life circles are that you know where there's a will, there's a way, um, and it's it's really become um, obvious around COVID that you know all of a sudden there was this situation that needed a massive public health response, and and some circumstances could change pretty rapidly because there was the will um, to do that, and then they found a way, and I think. Um, and I tend to be interested in other comments coming in the chat box on this. When I think about the issue of stipends, you know, what I what I often hear from folks is that there isn't a budget, or there isn't money um, to do that. But if if we step back and sort of look for some opportunities um, to make that happen, if there's value put on to that type of engagement, um, and if there's the will to have it happen, then maybe there's a way to find that, that um, it isn't maybe always more money, maybe it's a diversion of funds from one spot to another um, in the interest of boosting up a, a certain voice. So um, try, yeah, that's uh, just random thoughts about um, you know finding budget in terms of, of stipend and, and recognizing that people who have lived experience, um, if, we, if we want to draw on their knowledge and value it as expertise, um, they're often speaking from their life. They're not speaking from a, a paid position in the same way that I'm speaking in this webinar right now. And so um, we have to recognize the value um, of their time and their expertise. I don't know if there's any other, anybody wants to comment on, on my comment, Charlene or, or Paul or Jenny or Beth? <laughs> 
charting here. Uh, can you still hear me? Yes. Yeah, you're good. Sorry, I had a little glitch on my computer. It looked like I might have been lost. But um, I just, I think it's really important in consideration of any initiative that people, whether research-based or whatever that looks like for people, that you really um, apply that into your proposal and take deep consideration on um, that often people with lived and living experience come to the tables in un unpaid roles. And it really is important to really think about that in the beginning um, when you're uh, drafting a proposal to think about what that would look like to make sure people are supported through travel, uh, if they may be in a community doing something and there might be times where they're not actually being paid, to recognize that their time has value as well and not just to assume that you have an obligation for the time that they sit at the table for, you know, one or two hours. If you brought somebody to community, you have to really consider, uh, you know, the, the fact that people with lived and living experience are then losing other opportunities that they have to earn money whatever way they, you know, they normally do that in time. So you really have to consider that uh, when drafting proposals and ensure that you have uh, equitable opportunities to pay people to be at those tables. Yeah, excellent. Thanks, Charlene. Kristen, is there another question? Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's quite a few rolling in, actually. Um, and, and I think the one thing that I wanted to maybe uh, ask, uh, Charlene, from what you were saying, is, is just ask, right? Like, people will know um, what some of the things that they, they might need, and, and they'll be better able to share them with you. You bet. Yeah. And, that, and you'll find that information. That, uh, so the best practice guidelines, both around peer payments, and engaging people with lived experience is, was designed, developed uh, uh, by people with lived experience through the whole process. So you'll find a lot of information in there that actually will help to answer many of the questions that are coming in as well. Uh, wonderful. So if, if we're okay um, and there's nobody else that would like to make a, a comment uh, or, or share their thoughts, I can move on to the next question. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, okay, great. So uh, I think our next question is really around um, how, where to start, how, how, to, how to start this process of, of engagement, um, and, and what, what some of the successes that you found with um, some of like, those initial meaningful uh, engagement experiences with, with peers. Paul, would you care to answer? <laughs> Um, what's a successful engagement? <laughs> um, or, like, or just one way to start, you know, Paul, like, um, like if, if you're kind of, feel like you're starting at, at square one, what's the, what are some of the things that you found successful for that kind of initial uh, jumping off of the starting point? Well, what, the, what I've found uh, successful just based on my experience working with Vancouver Coastal Health is uh, just being treated as professional, basically. You know, because the information that we bring to the table is valuable information, things that um, most people won't recognize. So um, just being recognized that your skills are helpful is probably the best way to engage peers. Jenny, do you are you do you have any thoughts on this about where yeah, I would, folks could start? Yeah, I was um think I was just thinking about like what we do at CSUN and how um, usually we'll start off with like like for instance um, there was some um, needles being left around our community and because I do clean team we went to CSUN and we had a peer engagement so we pay peers to come in and and we had like eight questions that we were going to ask about how we could support them in not not leaving um, needles and especially around schools and stuff like that and some of the reasons why they think that that happens. So getting, them, getting peers in the room and asking them how they think it should be done, like the present or the engagement, like what are your ideas on what the group norms should be? What are your ideas on what the topic should be? Um, do you have any um, any any norms like to make you feel safe, like for instance, not interrupting or, or whatever? So, getting their input on every step of every step of the engagement, um, from the idea that first comes up all the way through to the implementation of the engagement. 
So even like the venue, like you have a, an idea where you want it to be, maybe outdoors in a park or in our CSUN office or, you know what I mean? So, um, and even what it's going to be about, like we can have an idea, but there, when you bring in people with experience, those ideas can kind of go off on different roads and they can add so much more to it than just, just one topic. You know what I mean? It could go off on many different topics that all have to do with the one topic that we just didn't think about until they come in and tell us. Yeah, and what I and what is Diana? What I think about is, um, you know, um, a, a community developer once said to me, "You have to be there before you want something from them." So it's that ongoing, um, intimate knowledge of community and connection with community where you can get feedback um, on an ongoing basis that can help inform those kinds of decisions. What you were just saying about you know getting feedback on every step of the engagement, what makes people feel comfortable, what yeah. you know, what makes people feel safe. Sometimes you don't know that from a one-off. We all never know that from a one-off kind of conversation. Right. You need to have relationships with the community. And and also I think a lot of the times the conversation will steer towards. Um, sometimes I found that um, like we, I think it's important. Um, um, to not ask like really personal questions right at first, you know, you kind of want to build that relationship up a little bit, even if it's in the in the room while you're doing it, um, kind of build it up. And like we don't have to tell like our, our whole story at every engagement we're at, you know. Some of them we just want our knowledge around like an OPS or something, right? So, um, like I think sometimes uh, people feel pressured to like like maybe share that that part of it when they don't, they're not they don't need to, to give the knowledge that, that you're requiring, right? Yeah. yeah, that's a really, that's just being respectful of boundaries. That's a really good point. Thank you, Jenny. That's really good. You're welcome. Kristen, is there another question? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think on the, on the uh, other side of, of the coin in terms of uh, getting started, uh, we, we'd also, I think, like to learn a bit more about some of the common challenges that are uh, encountering with meaningfully engaging uh, peers, and if there have been any strategies that have uh, worked to, to overcome some of those challenges. Charting here. Mm -hmm. I think uh, uh, there's a lot of challenges uh, with engagement around travel, um, and people with lived and living experience quite often uh, are faced with um, stigma as far as even like checking into a hotel, all yeah. those like things that most people take uh, advantage of in, in their daily lives that where people with lived and living experience quite often find uh, barriers to lots of um, issues when it comes to being connected. And I just want to go a little bit back to the previous question and uh, I will say it again, I think it's really important uh, that we uh, take opportunity as well to give people with lived and living experience opportunities to build their capacity. It's very important to have a uh, peer coordinator uh, who can help to assist with the whole process, bringing peers in. Peers um, inherently trust each other more than we trust the systems, and that's due to uh, just the historical, you know, kind of uh, negative and uh, situations that we face and the barriers that we face as well. And so. A uh, peer coordinator can really connect with other peers and think about uh, bringing uh, diverse voices to the table, um, thinking about those key components about things that have the challenges that they have. I think overcoming them really is just identifying uh, a potential issue or identifying an issue from feedback that you've gathered with peers and just finding a way to work through it. But I think a peer coordinator really is a great place to start, but it's also important to recognize that you have to give opportunity for all peers to build their capacity uh, to be able to do this work better. Quite often we're leaning on a few key peers um, within the province of BC, I certainly recognize this, and, and it creates a position of burnout for people. When we have, we go to like the people that we know that are, that do this work really well, but we're not investing a lot of time and energy in um, building the capacity of additional people to help to share wow. and shoulder that work, and mm -hmm. then it creates uh, opportunities for people to really get burned out, and it's something that I see quite often. Hmm. Um, also, I'd like to um, um, add, like, um, there's some of the uh, conferences and engagements that I, most of them actually, that I've went to, 
um, had a um, like a safe room where people could go and use, and also they had a substance navigator there, so people didn't have to leave the venue and go out and search for substances. There was somebody there where they could do it safe, and I think that's a really important thing um, when you're engaging people that use drugs that you have that space for them, um, and and somebody there that can support them while they're doing that. Um, otherwise, I, I feel like you'd be left to like try and find people at the last minute. Um, you're also, you're not knowing what's going on. So if they do need a check in to see if they're okay after a few minutes, like stuff like that, it's just much safer to have um, like an OPS room and um, like somebody that you know that could um, that could have like drugs that they know what the drugs are um, and the potency and stuff, so they can tell people. You know, you have to be really careful and use way less with this mm -hmm. or, you know what I mean, like, um, so it's just done safely. I think when we leave that part out of it, it leads to a lot of um, unsafe positions that um, peers can get into. And, yeah. um, you know, I'd hate to, like, lose somebody at a, at a, at a conference because they were, they were by themselves and they went and got somewhere, some drugs from somebody they didn't know. And, and safety, you know, emotionally as well, right? Um, exactly. And cultural and safety. For, and, yeah. and for abstinence use, um, the abstinence people as well. Um, it's important yeah. to have the, yeah. those supports in place for for the for them as well for people that don't use anymore. Yeah. Okay. So it's considering the needs. Of, of, so that once again uh, goes back to having uh, a peer coordinator who really understands yeah. all those little intricate pieces that really keep uh, everybody safe and uh, just make it a really respectful mm -hmm. opportunity for people to engage. Uh, somebody who has experience around that would know all of those key components and the importance behind all of them and can help mm -hmm. to uh, disseminate that information with a team of people who may not quite understand the purpose of why we request certain things being done. Yeah, that's, you know, it's really thoughtful because, I mean, how else would we know unless we've lived that and not not all of us have lived that and so um, that's why we need to do that engagement right Kristen I think we have time for maybe one more question is there another one there can I just add uh, something really quickly um, oh, yeah, to, to what, yeah. so, so hi um, my name is Emily Salvos and I, I am I'm the nurse educator with the harm reduction services team that works um, why well, I'm I, I I get to I get to work with as often as I can, <laughs> which is really really nice. Hi everyone. Um, mm -hmm. just on the operational side, I think like some things to also consider and to like add on to what was already said by um Jenny and Charlene and and Paul, and I think that um do you, it's having the internal work done so that nothing is a surprise for people because um, in part some of the things in setting up an in-house OPS um, we actually do have a document for setting up like a temporary OPS for meetings and events which I can get Kurt to send over um, uh, but I think um, making sure that the washrooms that folks are going to use, having sharps in there, and then if those are shared bathrooms, then letting um, letting folks know that the, of the event that's going on. I think that you know people often want to know more about the event than maybe other events that would be hosted, and I think having good boundaries about no, like we're just going to let you know the what what any other event. Um, would be required to share in terms of just like having good boundaries and, and ensuring legitimacy and, and trying to, yeah. you know, socialize it in a way, you know. And so I think, yeah, I guess that's the word I'm trying to think about, which is also a whole other <laughs> whole other conversation about, about that word. But, but socializing it within the organizations and institutions that you, that you work with. And, and often that, that comes with, you know, there's concerns that come up and then having the conversations around, you know, like having an OPS is, is supported in the province of BC by the, by the, you know, so just bringing in those ministerial orders to just be like, you know, no, like we're going to do this work and this is important work and we'd be really stoked if you could get on board. Yeah. Um, also, I'd like to, uh, you were asking about the pay um, part of it earlier, and I, I think that as long as um, um, the peers, in, uh, like, know what the process is ahead of time, 
um, like I went to one one time and we thought we were gonna, there was like a mix up. So the first day they were there, people didn't think they were gonna be getting paid and they had to wait for like quite a long time once they got there to get it. Cause they, like we said, they said they were gonna pay and then when we, everybody got there, it was like all of a sudden they weren't gonna be paid for that day. So a lot of people that get there, they're relying on that money to not be sick and, and, and to even eat as well. Sometimes they don't have that money with them when they get there. Yeah. So I think it's really important that the pay is cash and like at the end of each day, like when, when or whenever it, you, it's stated that it's going to be, it's really important that that be followed through, I think. Yeah. Yep. No, that's really, that's really important. Um, Unfortunately, we're at time, <laughs> and uh, we've still got some some other questions there. So I think what we're going to do is um, we've we've got those questions written down. I think what we'll do is talk to our presenters um, after the event here and see if we can uh, get some responses to share back with the group.